buenas tardes a, a todos. Vamos a continuar con el, con el siguiente track que tiene que ver con seguridad y sistemas de información en, en salud. Tenemos la suerte de tener al doctor Eric Kuhn. Eric Kuhn es jefe de informática médica en la Universidad de Duke y trabaja aparte en atención primaria y ha diseñado desde la visión y el origen sistemas de información para atención primaria. Y hoy nos viene a hablar de un tema que la verdad que es eh, completamente relevante para la seguridad del paciente, que es la, la administración de, de medicamentos por, por código de barra. Así que eh, le damos la bienvenida a Eric. Thank you for staying here. Welcome. We are ready for you. Well, it is indeed an honor to be able to uh, be invited to the beautiful city of Buenos Aires uh, and visit um, the, the wonderful sites in Argentina. So uh, today is Thanksgiving Day in the United States. So I'd like to give my thanks to the audience uh, for allowing me to share with you our experience um, in uh, okay in uh, in deploying uh, medication scanning at the point of care to make sure that we are as safe as possible as we take care of patients who are sick in the hospital. So this is what I'd like to go over today. I want to go over some basic information around uh, hospital medication errors, uh, focusing obviously on errors uh, in, in transcription and administration. Um, So, and, and then I, I want to uh, talk about uh, the, uh, what, what Barco Medication Administration Systems look like. Uh, obviously, there are many that are available from vendor systems. And then um, we want to talk briefly about the evidence behind what, what these systems can do to improve medication safety. Uh, and then I think most importantly, I wanted to talk about how these systems affect the workflow of frontline nurses uh, and in, in, in their busy lives taking care of patients minute to minute. And then uh, share with you some of our, our uh, experiences in making these systems successful. Uh, and then uh, time permitting, I'll talk a little bit about what are some of the things that you may want to focus on after you're done uh, implementing barcode medications uh, scanning. So uh, this is a picture from uh, one of the hospitals I've worked at uh, in the intensive care unit, where, as you can see here, many medications are being delivered through IV pumps at the same time. And uh, as you can see here, some of these medications are, are being labeled using post-it notes. Uh, and uh, you can imagine that uh, with patients are sick enough to be in the, in the intensive care unit, This is uh, a high-risk situation where uh, medications with lots of side effects are being given uh, at the same time to patients, and one single error could, could be potentially fatal. And the, the whole area of patient safety, as many of you know, is founded on this conceptual model of uh, Swiss cheese put forward by James Reason in the United Kingdom where he basically com he compares the, ins the issue of, of errors and, and harm to patients as blocks of Swiss cheese, with each hole in the Swiss cheese being a, an error that happens. Most of the time, even if one error happens, the, there is another block of cheese that blocks the error that pre and prevents harm from being done to patients. But once in a while, all the holes line up and the error is, is able to reach uh, the patient. And what information technology can do if it's implemented correctly is that it will uh, actually make the holes smaller. And it will also make the appearance and disappearance of these holes a little bit more predictable so that you can control the system. So before I go on, I just wanted to introduce a few terms that I'm going to be using in my talk. These are terms that we use to talk about medication errors. First of all, a medication error, we define as any error at any stage of the medication use process. It can be at the physician ordering stage, uh, the transcribing stage, dispensing stage, administration, or monitoring. Not all of these medication errors would actually lead to patient harm. 
Uh, but the, the ones that do, we call them adverse drug events. These are events when a medication error ends up causing injuries uh, to patients. Many of these errors, while they could harm patients, actually don't end up harming patients. We call them potential adverse drug events. So these are incidents or medication errors that could lead to injury, but they uh, sometimes they don't. So while the system of medication administration probably is different across uh, hospitals around the world, it follows the same basic elements. Uh, first of all, the physician orders the medication, um, and in the paper-driven world, those orders are often faxed to the pharmacy, and, uh, and then the, the nurses or the secretaries on the unit would actually copy those orders to the paper-based medication administration records. And of course, the pharmacy will deliver medications to the units, and at the right time, the nurse will use the medication sheets, the medication administration record, to, to administer uh, the, the medication to the right patient at the right time. Dr. Lee, back in, in, um, in the 90s, actually studied all the serious errors. These are errors that actually at least have potential to harm patients, and found that about half of these errors, serious errors, happened at the point of ordering. But then about 14% uh, happened at the dispensing stage, another 11% happens at the transcription stage, and 26% happened in the administration stage. So even with computerized order entry, even with a perfect uh, computerized order entry system, you are only going to be able to eliminate about half of your serious errors, which is what, one of the reasons why so many hospitals have, have implemented barcode scanning system, not only at the bedside, but also at the pharmacy. So just to give you an overview of how these uh, systems would work, I've actually redrawn the diagram you saw in, uh, on the previous slide. And, and what happens typically before you implement barcode medication administration is that the medications are picked in the pharmacy uh, uh, manually. Uh, and then uh, the nurses rely on manual transcription to generate the paper administration records. And the administration, as you can imagine, is also manual. With the implementation of barcode technology, the first one of the first things you likely will do is to start the scanning at the point of pharmacy dispensing. So uh, what I've here is, is to replace the manual dispensing with barcode assisted dispensing. And with and as, as you rely on the computer to generate the uh, medication administration record, you eliminate the step of transcribing. And of course, the system will help the nurse decide when to give the medication to the right patient. So let's take a moment to, to talk about uh, how barcode scanning can actually reduce dispensing errors. So what I've drawn here is a cartoon that describes the historical or traditional process. Medication, uh, pharmacy technicians will be picking medications out of shelves, and they're typically, at least in the US, visually verified by a pharmacist before the medications are sent to the patient care units. And barcode scanning uh, basically uh, asks the pharmacy technician to, after they pick the medication off the shelf, to scan the medication to make sure that the right medication is picked. And if the wrong medication is picked, the pharmacy technician will be given a warning and they cannot continue unless they put the medication back on the shelves. So one would imagine this step at being somewhat, somewhat effective at reducing the number of dispensing errors in the pharmacy. And what we did at the Brigham and Women's Hospital was to uh, look at the number of errors that, that were still allowed to leave the pharmacy after we instituted barcode scanning. What we saw was that uh, the number of dispensing errors went down from 0.88% uh, to 0.61%. Uh, corresponding to a 31% reduction. And the number of serious dispensing errors that actually have the potential to harm patients, these are the potential adverse drug events, 
that went down from 0.19% to 0.07%, corresponding to a 63% reduction. Now, one might wonder, these are pretty small numbers. What does it really mean? So to project out the numbers to uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital where th this data was collected, this is a busy hospital that dispensed at that time about 6 million doses a year. Uh, with, uh, amongst the patients are in their 777 beds. And it, it, every year at these rates, even with an imperfect barcode scanning system, we are dispensing about, we are preventing about 13,500 medication dispensing errors and of which 6,000 would actually have the potential for harm. So this was an early gain in our implementation of the barcode medication scanning process. So after we were done implementing medication scanning in the pharmacy, we went, went on to implement uh, a medication scanning system on the patient care units. And the way it works, as you can imagine, it's not that different from what you do scanning barcodes uh, at supermarkets. Uh, there is a, an application that we have built, which basically will serve up the medication administration record. We call that the electronic medication administration record that will prompt the nurse what medications are due and what patient and, and other information that's pertinent to the nursing care process. And at the right time, the application will prompt uh, the, the nurse to scan the barcode on the medication uh, using the handheld scanner that's connected to the computer using uh, Bluetooth, and they will scan the wristband on the patient to make sure that the medication is being given to the right patient. If uh, the nurse happens to pick the wrong medication, for example, the nurse is picking the wrong dose of the medication, he or she will be given a word that looks something somewhat like this. And, and when the nurse scans um, the patient's wristband, it, it, there is a mismatch between uh, the active patient on the electronic medication administration record and the uh, wristband the patient is wearing, uh, she is going to get a wrong patient record. So while these are fairly simple uh, interventions, uh, there are pretty disastrous consequences if the wrong medications uh, were given. Uh, one of the more famous examples came from um, uh, uh, Indiana, where um, uh, uh, an actor, Dennis Quaid, some of you might recognize him, he is a lot older now, uh, but at that time, about 10 years ago, he had a set of twins, uh, and uh, his twins were born early, so they had to go uh, to the neonatal intensive care unit, and there was a, a mix-up between uh, two uh, Two, two different uh, concentrations of heparin. Uh, the two, what one is for just flushing the line and the other one is for thinning the blood. And the one that is need, needed uh, to uh, thin the blood is a thousand times stronger than the one used for flushing the line. And uh, the nurse actually made a mistake uh, and used a stronger one to clean out the line. Fortunately, uh, the two babies uh, did not suffer any adverse consequences. So that was the happy news. But the same mistake actually happened to three other babies that there were some pretty bad consequences uh, because of bleeding. So um, what we wanted to do at the Brigham and Women's Hospital was to understand the impact of uh, this barcode scanning system. So we set out to observe uh, a large number of medication administration at the bedside before we implemented uh, the barcode scanning system. And then we uh, did the same types of observations afterwards. Uh, and, uh, and we compared the, uh, the observations to the orders to detect um, administration errors. So these are some of the findings from about 10 years ago now that we published in the New England Journal. What we found was that even with an early version of the medication scanning uh, process at the bedside, we were able to reduce uh, the number of um, medication administration errors to 11.5% to 6.8%. And the subset of these errors that actually had the potential to harm patients went down from 3.1% to 1.6%, corresponding to about a 50% reduction. And we found that amongst the potential adverse drug events, uh, there were statistically significant reductions 
uh, in, in um, areas that have the potential to cause significant harm and serious harm. Uh, there were very few life threatening errors, so we did not find a statistically significant difference. And of course, because we eliminated uh, transcription, uh, we actually found uh, no transcription errors uh, after the system was implemented. But it's actually instructive to look at all the transcription errors that happen uh, in the paper transcription world. And you can see that 6.1% um, of the transcriptions contain some kind of errors, of which about half of them had the potential to harm patients. So what does this mean? And I think I've shown you some early data uh, around barcode scanning, both at the pharmacy and uh, at the bedside. So again, if you extrapolate out the data for a hospital that administers about 6 million doses of medications a year, this barcode scanning is preventing about 95,000 potential adverse drug events every year in a single hospital. But it's also important to understand that these errors did not completely go away, and there are many reasons for that. And that actually speaks to the hard journey that many of us are still on in making the system perfect. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the things we have learned along the way. But one of the things that we heard loud and clearly from the nurses uh, before we implemented the system was that, is this system going to slow me down? So one of the things that we were able to do as we implemented the system was that we actually used, uh, we used direct observations to measure the, the amount of time the nurses spend on different tasks uh, on the units before and after they implemented the barcode medication scanning system. Um, I won't have time to go into the details here, but what we found through these observations was that the proportion of time the nurses spend on the entire process of medication administration actually did not change. Uh, and that um, what we also found that they spent more time at the patient's bedside, which in some ways was expected because now the nurses, rather than scanning the medications in front of the medication uh, stations, they actually had to do it in the patient's rooms. And we also surveyed our nurses uh, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And overall, we found that nurses felt that the medication use process was becoming more safer. Uh, and was more efficient after the implementation of barcode technology. Of course, this hides a lot of details. There was a lot of work that went in there to allow this to happen. Uh, which is why I think it's important for us to at least talk about some of the things that we have learned along the way. We have found that in order for any healthcare information technology to succeed, you really need different disciplines uh, particularly the clinicians who are going to be using the system at the table to understand not only what they themselves are doing, but also what the other disciplines are doing currently in the old system and in the future state so that they can, uh, they can anticipate some of the pitfalls and they can help educate their colleagues about things that are going to be particularly challenging to them. Uh, I think that when it comes to changing nursing workflow, we have consistently found that it is really important to provide hands-on training uh, and that the training uh, should not just be, be about completing tasks, it should be about uh, scenarios that they may encounter at the bedside. Uh, so for example, when we implemented the barcode scanning system, the nurses spent uh, four hours in the classroom using the computer and then they, they also spent a few hours uh, sc actually actively scanning medications in order to practice what they have learned. I think these systems are large and expensive and it's easy to shortchange the people and the resources needed. My advice to you is don't because uh, the first day you put in the system is only the beginning of the journey. You, there's a lot of support that is needed. For example, what you will find is that a lot of medications don't scan well because of a variety of reasons. Maybe the barcodes weren't prepared right by the drug vendors or if they were printed within um, the hospital, they, there might be some technical errors with the barcodes. And you need to continue to work on them and perfect them so that the users feel that you are actually continuing to make the system better. And you need to listen to them and make improvements uh, as the software uh, improves as well. 
And of course, this is a significant change. You do need your leaders to buy in and support you. There will be bumps along the road and leaders need to make themselves visible uh, and, and support folks who um, might be having a difficult time. Uh, we know that when we roll out any uh, major health IT systems, there are some tears from uh, both physicians and nurses uh, out of frustration. And I think it's easy to, uh, to, to brush them off as folks who are immature. But what we should also bear in mind is that uh, physician, physicians and nurses and other clinicians pride themselves at what they do every single day. And, and they don't, uh, we are speaking as a clinician, I don't want to uh, feel incompetent. But when you ask them to use a new system, they are incompetent. They are, they are beginners uh, in the system. So helping them get over that hump is, is an important part of that transition. Which is why we, uh, when we implemented these major systems, we actually have a lot of support available um, on the units to help them through this. And then um, one thing that we've also found is that uh, it is easy to let the computer, trust the computer uh, to tell you exactly what, what to do. And what we have discovered that is that we need to remind our nursing colleagues that they, that, that, that they need to trust the professional critical judgment so that they, uh, they actively think about why the system is telling them uh, a, a medication should not be given to a patient. Uh, and then they, they should also involve uh, communication with pharmacy and physicians so that the team can continue to work together uh, during this transition. Okay. And, and one of the things that we, uh, we, we found is really important is to uh, look at the scanning rate early on. Uh, I think, uh, so th these are uh, our latest scanning rates uh, from Duke University Health System where I work. And, uh, and I think, again, uh, typically when you start these scanning systems, putting in these scanning systems, uh, the scanning rate might be in the 80s, 80% uh, range. And there's a lot of hard work that goes in fixing barcodes, uh, helping uh, clinicians who are struggling to use the system so that you can consistently hit uh, at least 95% in terms of your scanning rates. So you may be, uh, be interested in knowing, so what are some of the things that uh, we at Duke have been working on now that we've had uh, the Barco medication scanning system for the last five years? So I just wanted to, to uh, give a preview of some of the things that you may also be interested in looking at. Incidentally, these are the things that are required by uh, HIMSS, uh, and I know, know that HIMSS is one of the sponsors of this conference, and actually in the session here, just before they were talking about how to achieve stage seven. Uh, and this, these are some of the uh, things related to uh, scanning that HIMSS requires in order for a hospital to acquire stage seven, which is the highest level of maturity for health information technology. So uh, one of the things that we've spent a fair amount of time working on is uh, scanning blood products. We know that it's disastrous if the wrong blood product is given to patients. And I, while I won't go into the details here, Making blood products sca uh, scanning work requires redesigning a lot of the workflow at the physician ordering end uh, so that we, we provide the right types of decision support uh, to, uh, to help physicians make the best choices about when to transfuse a patient. And, and of course, uh, the nurses also need to be involved in communicating with the blood bank as to when uh, to send, uh, send blood products to the units and, and when they are ready to to, uh, to administer the blood products, they, there's a lot of uh, checks and balances to make sure that the barcode scanning uh, is robust uh, and that the absolute right product is being given to the patient. And we still rely on two nurses to do that job. Uh, but as you can see here from some of the pictures, there's quite a few steps that we, re we require our nurses to go through in the blood administration process. You may also be interested in thinking about uh, making sure that the blood specimens that are collected by either nursing or phlebotomy is correctly labeled. Uh, uh, so we've done that by introducing a lot of barcode printers uh, uh, for, the, for the phlebotomist. So they carry a mobile printer. So when they are ready to draw blood for patients, 
they, they label, uh, they, they generate the label, put them on the tubes before they draw blood. And this has helped us really cut down on the number of specimens that are wrongly collected on the patients. Uh, and of course, the scanning step makes sure that all the points in the workflow are conducted in the right way, in the, in the right sequence. Next, you may also be thinking about uh, breast milk. If you take care of a neonatal population, you may know that uh, the mother's breast milk, uh, not only is it important for the nutritional growth uh, of the patient, uh, they, being, uh, if, if a, one of these uh, premature babies is given uh, the wrong mother's milk, it actually can have pretty bad consequences. So we've implemented a similar system to make sure that as the mother uh, pumps her milk uh, intended for, uh, for her baby, we actually start labeling it at the point of the milk production. So when the, when the milk is stored and given to the infant later, uh, we know that the right milk is being given. So these are some of the things that we have done in order to achieve uh, stage seven at Duke. And uh, there are lots of things that we've learned along the way and we look forward to sharing our experiences with you. So thank you.